Um, so thank you all for being with us tonight for another installment of our Providence Art Club Zoom lecture series. We're very happy to have you for a talk with Fauna. Um, many of you know her from her time in Rhode Island and all the great things that she's done around here. Um, she did her undergrad at Rhode Island College and did her graduate degree at RISD. Um, she has done murals in many, many locations. She's a muralist. She's a teaching artist. She's an educator. Um, and in between all of those things, she manages to make her own work. Um, and so tonight we're going to get to see a range of those things with a focus on collaboration. And I'm very excited to hear from Fauna. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, she's going to do her presentation. If you have questions at any time, just put them right in the chat so you don't forget them. And then we will do all the questions together at the end. Um, and I'll ask your question for you just so that everybody can hear it. Um, but, and you'll all be muted during the presentation. So do put your question in the chat. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna let Fauna take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Michael, for hosting me. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I know it's been a rough, re rough week, but I'm really glad that we can have this space together to talk about collaboration and collaborative aesthetics. So my name is Fauna. Some of you know me as Kamiko. Today I'm going to share about collaborative aesthetics, social impact, and shared authorship in collaborative arts. I'll be sharing some of my personal work, some participatory projects I've developed for public audiences, as well as some collaborative projects I've created with community partners. We'll dive into what the difference between participatory and collaborative looks like in visual arts, what some of the challenges are in creating these types of projects and what sorts of outcomes can result. I encourage you to use the react buttons and to add your comments and questions in the chat along the way. And as Michael said, we'll pause to answer those at the end. Oops. I am a two-dimensional artist specializing in murals and soft pastel. My work has evolved into a pop realism style, drawing upon impressionism, street art, and tattoo culture. Human and animal subjects are my primary focus, and I often incorporate natural elements and text into my designs. My artwork is most easily recognized for its sensitivity and expert use of color. Through my artwork, I attempt to process the interrelated influences of history, power, and heritage on the environment and on the psyche. I painted murals in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Florida, Guam, and California. I've collaborated with schools, businesses, and individuals in mural designs and curatorial projects. I've received an award for my portrait work, an award for my mural work, and three awards for my community-based work. I have over a decade of experience developing community-based arts programming and coming from a background in positive youth development and arts education, I incorporate showcases and public art into my teaching practice whenever possible. In March of 2020, I relocated to Austin, Texas, right when the pandemic started. So not only was I in a new region, but mural work dried up globally. Artists found themselves unemployed and when opportunities started to open back up, those calls for artists were exponentially more competitive than they were pre-pandemic. So since I was fully employed, I took a break from pursuing murals and shifted my focus to my personal studio practice. And because of that, many of the projects that I'll share today are from 2019 and earlier. And at the end, I'll share about some upcoming projects. So let's start by looking at what public engagement looks like. Whether you're an artist or a government agency, there are similarities in how you might approach public participation. So this chart that I'll review is from the International Association for Public Participation. So starting at the lowest end of engagement, an organizer of a project might simply inform their audience. This can look like a public notice stapled to a fence, for example. There's no invitation for dialogue, only a declaration. This is what I've done. Or an organizer might consult with their audience prior to making a decision. This can look like surveys or public comments at a town hall. Specific information is requested by the organizer and then a decision is made 
with that information in mind. A consultation process is a one direction information gathering effort. If an organizer involves their audience, they are engaging them throughout multiple stages of the process. The dialogue continues past one point of contact, but the decision power remains with the organizer. In collaborative projects, an organizer shares decision-making power with their audience, and that shared authority is what's key here. And finally, the ideal form of audience participation is that the organizer acts more as a facilitator, allows their audience to drive the project and make final decisions. The approach to engagement that an organizer takes depends on the time and resources available to support public engagement, as well as the risk level of a project. If a community that is impacted by a decision isn't involved, then the risk increases. So the more a project can impact a community, the deeper their engagement should be. When I first encountered this chart, it felt very familiar to me. Uh, I was seeing parallels in public art and I found that there is a really direct connection to be made. So let's think of this spectrum of participation in regards to arts. These categories aren't perfect and they're not meant to be rigid. It's meant to be more of a helpful framework. So if an artist creates a piece in their studio or even in public, but it's entirely their creative direction, the audience is simply a viewer and a receptor of that artwork. The artist is informing the audience of something they made, a message they wanna communicate, and it might spark dialogue or an emotional response, but the artwork doesn't require the audience's participation to be completed. So, Commissions are made in consultation with the client. The artist gathers information on what the client wants and then executes the project with their own creative approach. In participatory art, the audience is directed in how to interact with an artwork in order to complete it. Their contributions are prescribed and superficial. An example that comes to mind is the Before I Die project which is a public art piece where an, an artist created a blackboard with the prompt, before I die. Uh, audience members were provided chalk to write their spot response. So the creative direction and how the audience were, would participate was predetermined by the artist. That does not mean it's a bad product project. It just means that it falls in a certain space in terms of audience engagement. In collaborative art, the audience shares creative direction with the lead artist. So this can look like a visual artist and a filmmaker collaborating on a community showcase or an artist working with a community group to develop the theme, palette, and content of a mural in their area. Socially engaged art would be projects in which the artist takes on a director role and works with the community to create change there is less emphasis on a visual product and more emphasis on social change. An example of that would be Rick Lowe's Project Row Houses. So similar to any other creative project, there are parameters that influence the direction of that project. Most importantly, how visible is, is it? Who does it impact? Who do I want to ensure is on board with the project before I implement it? Often mural projects that are funded by public dollars will begin with a community engagement. People who live or work near the installation site are invited to meet with the artists and give some input on what the content of the design might include. What are the client goals? Do they have guidance on the content? Some clients will have a very prescribed idea of what they want. Others will give the artist full creative liberty with minimal requirements. That's my favorite type of project to work on because so many of my public pieces have been made in collaboration with various partners. So the opportunity to bring my own concepts is increasingly precious. Uh, I still enjoy projects with specific guidance because complete freedom sometimes can be stagnating. Another consideration is who are the collaborators and what is their skill level? 
You'll have very different outcomes when working with a group of 15 first graders than you would with the group of five AP art high school students. When working with very young children, you might involve them more in the ideation process than the execution, or you might give a very specific task if they're involved in the actual painting. You would probably provide them pre-made colors and direct them where something needs to be filled in, where an older participant might be able to mix their own colors and really be involved in the painting. Some other very real considerations are access to the site, the budget, and the time that you have available to work with your participants. One of the benefits of working outdoors is that you'll probably have a lot more time to access the site, whereas indoor murals usually require that someone be on site to let you in. So for the rest of our time, I'll share some projects that I worked on that demonstrate some of the key categories on the audience, on the spectrum of audience participation. So this is my 2017 entry for Punto Urban Art Museum, a street art museum based in Salem, Mass. My design was pre-made, not developed in collaboration with the community, but still created with the public in mind. And it's about eight feet by eight feet. So Punto Urban Art Museum is a project by the North Shore Community Development Coalition based in the Point neighborhood of Salem. They bring in big name artists from around the world and they have one wall consisting of 20 spaces where local artists are invited to apply to participate. And the community wall changes out annually in September. I definitely would put this on your list of things to see if you go visit Salem. So there's a slight distinction that I want to make here. Punto is collaborative or participatory since local artists are invited to paint and they're also invited to bring their own creativity and original designs. Uh, you could see pieces of two other artists paintings on each side of mine here. Occasionally artists will collaborate from youth groups from the area and I just want to give credit to that but just point out that the designs for I've used for this have been my own creative direction. And this particular painting titled So Pretty It Hurts was inspired by one of the cats that my stepmother adopted. Uh, cats have always been a muse of mine going, very, going back to my very first drawings. And with this cat, I just got a kick out of how pathetic she looked after getting her summer haircut. Um, there is great response to this piece and it won first place in the juried contest of local artists that year. This is a mural I did in 2019 at School of Rock in Seekonk, Mass. It's 44 feet wide and 10 feet high, completed in spray paint and exterior latex paint. The design was made in consultation with two staff members that manage this location. And the goal here was to create a mural to instill excitement and pride for the students at the School of Rock and the outcomes were immediate visibility for the school's new location, positive response from students and their families and Seekonk community members. This is another commission that I designed for Kodokai Dojo in North Smithfield. I've been a student here a few times, so I was able to bring some of my knowledge of the style into the design. Uh, their symbol is the octopus, so I use the great Pacific octopus as reference. The primary martial art taught at Kodokai is Okinawan palace hand, which has the fluidity of Aikido and the joint locks of jujitsu. In this style, how you move is a big component of the techniques, so I designed the octopus with those principles in mind. All four legs on the right side of the octopus are moving forward and all four legs on the opposite side are positioned backwards to mimic how practitioners move in that style. Readiness is another key principle and students are taught to keep their hands facing their opponent. So all eight of the tentacles are facing toward the invisible opponent of the octopus. This is an exercise I created for an introductory level high school art class. Uh, I wanted to introduce the grid transfer technique, which is how I use to scale up images for murals. 
I, I wanted to minimize time spent on figuring out the math and focus students on this practice piece on just the transfer practice and mixing paints. I chose a few images, cropped them into squares and pre-cut paper squares for the students to transfer the image onto. The class bit split into groups of four. They chose one of the reference images to work from and assigned, assigned themselves one corner to work on so they could work toward the goal of having one complete image that they made together. So the image on the left, each color is a different student's contribution to their group exercise. And same thing on the right, each quarter was done by a different student. This approach allowed them to practice a technique on something that wasn't precious and to work towards a shared goal with their classmates. They compared their work throughout the process to ensure that their sections were lining up, which provided an extra layer of looking for accuracy. And you can see here how two different groups had different results, even when working with the same reference image. And after this exercise, they completed individual projects using, using their own reference images and doing their own measurements. And this is an interactive I developed for a school partnership event at Peabody Essex Museum. Children who participated in our school partnership program had an event celebrating the artwork that they created in response to their museum visits. We wanted to provide a drop-in activity, something that didn't require much explanation or technical expertise. And as always, our programs tied back to one of the open exhibitions. At the time, there was an exhibition open called Wild Designs, which focused on art and design inspired by nature. And the concept here was simple. We had a pipe and drape set up and we provided some string for attendees to collectively build a spider web. And this added some energy to the event and provided an invitation to interact with each other. This project is another that was created in response to an exhibition in PEMS Art and Nature Center during my time as a connected learning developer. The exhibition we were working with that year was Lunar Attraction, which featured art and design inspired by the moon. And the program I managed there was ArtLink, the museum's outreach program. I worked with out of school groups of all ages, most of them coming to the museum multiple times over the course of the year for an hour at a time. These visits included a tour of an exhibition and a hands-on art making activity with the art making usually about 30 minutes. So projects had to be quick and easy to understand. Having this public art background, whenever I could, I would provide opportunities to showcase student work. This builds up visibility of the program internally and externally while also giving students and their parents something that they could be proud of. In this project, I had several different groups of students collectively complete a lunar landscape using what they learned about the geographic features of the moon. They provided, they were provided a mix of paper mache clay, uh, another type of clay, some ink and black glitter to create their surface. The goal was to complete a large piece that we would then display in the education studios. The result was these three 18 by 24 inch panels. Um, they also created little cards that described the lunar features uh, and those were added to the piece later so that visitors to the studio could learn and know what they were looking at. This piece was on display at their end of year exhibition and I use it as a way to entice them to come to the event where they could see the final product. Give Some Love was developed for a birthday party that was being held as a fundraiser for Punto Urban Art Museum. Uh, I developed the concept for attendees to contribute to a collective piece that the host could take home. And again, the concept was simple and cleanup was minimal. I provided some heart-shaped templates and participants could, of course, draw freehand too. We had somebody draw a real organ looking heart in there. And I pre-selected the paint markers to ensure that no matter what marker someone picked up, the piece would have color harmony. 
Then as participation dwindled down, I used a black marker and orange to go in and add black outlines and a single background color to unify the piece. These were about 24 by 36 inches and were done in Posca paint markers on canvas. These next two projects are collaborations that I completed with teens, again in my role as connected learning developer. Uh, it wasn't part of my job specifically to provide these mural experiences, but I brought to the role my practice as an artist and I use these projects to strengthen relationships with program partners. When doing community-based programs, trust is very important and it can be difficult to build trust if everything is only done in your space on your terms. This is why I made an effort to go to their spaces, and in every case, I made sure that what we were doing supported the goals of that specific partner. These next projects are teen-led, and I am more of a facilitator. I have relinquished authorship entirely so the teens could get the most out of the experience. In this case, the partner was New Liberty Innovation School. It was a small group of students that was interested and ultimately there was really only one that was really dedicated to the project, but that one student was able to make a highly visible contribution to their school culture and to have a deep and meaningful learning experience. We began with a group of about four students developing proposals for the wall and we obtained feedback from teachers and students at the school before choosing a design and installing the piece. This mural is the design of that lead student and I helped them with the installation, mostly one-on-one -on -one, with occasional support from other students and staff, kind of a, a drop-in style um, help out if you wanna paint. So we, and involving as many people as possible in these projects helps build that sense of community and solidifying project buy-in. When doing these projects, I strive to make the process reflect real world mural design processes so that participants are prepared to pursue their own projects. At the close of this installation, I shared with the lead student a local mural competition, that's the Salem Mural Slam, they applied, were accepted, painted a really beautiful mural, this time in public, all on their own, and they were paid for their work. When I first started working on this program, this particular partner only had three students who showed up for their first visit. And after this project and at the end of our second year together, I was able to bring the entire school to the museum for a custom program. This project was done in collaboration with teens at Leap for Education, a teen center in Salem. I went to their site to talk through with their staff what we might do together. And they had this display where the teens could write their current goals that they would update regularly as their goal wall. And we decided to make a more permanent version of it. Uh, I began the project by meeting with the teens and having them brainstorm and draw suggestions for the wall. I was more involved in the development of the design for this since the group there was less confident in their artistic abilities. Uh, the final design we chose was this leaf pattern, which was completed entirely in chalk paint so they could write directly on the wall and update it whenever needed. We painted this over the course of about a month with everyone welcome to participate. This was a fruitful experience and I saw increased engagement from this group as for the rest of their visits to the museum. And finally, this is a mural project that I led in Newport with a group of teens. This was the first time the program was one that I managed rather than a community partnership. I had sufficient time with the teams and this group was highly creative and we had ample access to the installation site and a budget to do a real authentic arts learning program. This is a career prep program for teens that lasted for about eight weeks with six participants. The program happened while this building was being renovated. So as part of the program, the teens were also involved in 
developing new signage for inside the building and for developing this mural, which was meant to bring attention to a building that was often missed. And they were compensated for their contributions to the renovation. I provided the teens with some design criteria and a template that they could use to mock up their proposals. I assembled a review panel to select the winning design and that panel included members of the organization as well as the manager of the hotel next door. Here you can see some of their proposals. They were all thoughtful and professional and compelling, uh, but the winning design was by Mia Stevenson, who was at the time a student at the Met School in Newport. Someone on the panel suggested that we take bits and pieces of everyone's designs so no one's feelings would be hurt. But if we had done that, we would have lost what made each of these proposals strong. Uh, there's also a strong, or sorry, there's also a social emotional learning component in dealing with rejection, which is a very real part of being an artist. Uh, and I knew that it was a group of mature young people and that they were mentally prepared for only one design to be selected. The whole group then worked together to implement the selected design. And going back to that social emotional component, I think it's important that they continue to be involved in the project and to still learn from the experience of the installation, even if their piece wasn't chosen. And this was a really amazing group of young women identifying and non-binary teens, and they became very close over the eight weeks. There was a lot of relationship building that went into the completion of the project, as well as the other program activities. We were learning alongside each other and completing something that was bold and beautiful. It was also exciting to have a group that was so woman heavy since the mural scene is so male dominated. And I was really happy for us as a group to take up that space. This design is highly geometric, so the teens experienced how to scale up a geometric design using chalk line and levels. For paint, we used a mix of spray and latex paints. The teens were involved in every step, and we closed the program with an unveiling ceremony. I'm no longer involved with the program, but a version of this project lives on with the same wall being used as an installation site. And for a completely different type of collaboration, this is something I did with the Boston-based photographer, Mel Tang. Mel was the artistic director of this photo shoot. Her idea was to take a portrait of me and incorporate my artwork into the shoot. She provided a surface for me to paint on and I developed the imagery and decided on wardrobe and makeup to match. The reference images that I used in painting the backdrop was pictures of plants that I took while living on Guam in 2016. I'm really attracted to the repetition and sharpness of palm fronds, and I've been using that, that motif in recent portraits too. Uh, I also included some double hibiscus with some artificially red leaves, as well as an orb weaving spider and its web. Uh, I loved this shoot because it was such a beautiful marriage of both of our creative practices. So whether you're an artist or someone who's interested in hiring an artist, here are some guiding questions for planning a mural. Blank walls are often the inspiration, but if you don't already have a wall in mind, think about where you might want a space to be activated. Then find the measurements of the wall and take pictures. The dimension of the wall or walls is an important factor because it relates directly to the budget. If you're hiring an artist, they'll need to calculate how much time the project will take, as well as equipment they might need to complete the installation. And having those dimensions available, as well as images of the space will help determine if a ladder or other scaffolding is needed, and it will help in calculating how much paint will be required. The timeline is something the artist and the client will need to align on, 
and the hours that the installation site are accessible is also important. What murals charge will vary, but they can usually work with the budget if you know, if they know what that budget is. For instance, you might be able to activate a 10 foot by eight foot wall with the painting that's only five feet in diameter. Intricacy will also factor into the budget. An abstract mural with limited colors will take much less time than a mural featuring multiple human subjects, for example. Usually a client has an idea of the content they want incorporated, and that can be a really good starting point. And of course, the artist is a big piece of the puzzle. It's important to work with an artist who works in the style that you like, rather than bring in an artist and ask them to work in a style that doesn't match their portfolio. If you need help finding an artist, you can reach out to an organization that works with muralists or check out websites like Creative Ground, WeScover, and Thumbtack. Word of mouth is another great way to find someone who will be reliable. Uh, but however you hear about an artist, it's important to look at their portfolio to really get a sense of their ability to execute an idea. I know we have a mix of creators and art appreciators in the audience, so I thought I'd close with some universal life lessons from a muralist. Uh, whether you're a muralist yourself or if you have no intention of ever painting one, you can still take something from my life as a muralist. Uh, one of my biggest lessons over the years is that I wish I had made better use of some of the opportunities that I had. There were a couple instances where I didn't put in my best effort because I felt that I had already put in enough work for what I was getting paid. Um, but now some of the pieces in my portfolio reflect that attitude instead of my actual skills. So now I'm trying to be better at not selling myself short and really making the most out of every opportunity. Uh, the work only ends when you're out of time or money. So this applies to all creative projects. The work only ends when you're out of time or money. You can work forever on most projects, iterating, revising, polishing, adding, deconstructing, reconstructing, throwing it out, starting all over again. Uh, and many of us will never be satisfied, but we have to move on at some point. And these two factors are usually what forces us. So learn to recognize when you've met one or both of these limits. How you spend your time reflects your priorities. If you feel that you're not spending enough time in the studio, pay attention to where you are budgeting your time and what sorts of things you put first. If you wanna increase your time in studio or working out whatever it is you wanna do more of, let the less important things come later. Spend your Saturday mornings painting and clean the bathroom later. Use PTO. If you have paid time off, use it. If you're not putting what you want to do first, you might need to reassess what your priorities are and make a change to reflect your priorities or acknowledge and accept that something else has become a bigger one. Time is one of the most precious commodities for an artist and we need to know how to protect it. One way I do this is to create a time budget I map out where I need to be spending my time. And if I put it in a visual format, like a calendar, it can help me prioritize from week to week. And when a project does come up, ask yourself before you take it on, if the odds are in your favor, and if so, if it will be worth the time that you'll need to commit. Experts know when to cheat. I've had a couple conversations where people insinuated that an artist using a grid transfer or a projector is cheating, but artists have always cheated. Think back to the camera obscura. Painters would make a box with a hole in it, position their subject on the other side and trace the image to start their painting. Artists have always used technology to support their process. And even with those supports, 
we still need to know how to paint and mix colors. So all of that to say, no matter what your discipline are, use the techniques that are available to you. Those techniques, projectors, grid transfers, pounce patterns, in the case of murals, they're all legitimate. And since time is precious, why not use them? And I think that's all for me for now. I have some closing comments, but I'll stop here for Q&A. Great, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, I feel like that was a good crash course and uh, everything that you're working on, everything that you're doing. Um, one question that came to mind for me, and for anyone who's here and you want to put a question in the chat, please put a question in the chat. You're very welcome to. Um, uh, Brianna said, such beautiful work and powerful programs. Thank you. Um, Sarah said, just wanted to clarify. So the mural you showed us at the Newport Art Museum is not permanent and is used as a changing installation space. Yeah, so uh, that installation was 2019. And that's one thing with being a muralist, a lot of these are temporary, they only last for a year. Um, some of them last longer, but even really big ones by really famous artists, they usually get reinstalled or painted over after like five or 10 years. Um, and I actually like that because it allows the, the scene to change and adapt and reflect the whatever the current um, artists or art scene is or community priorities. So I actually come to really appreciate that temporality. You, you saw the follow-up question coming. Um, one of my questions was going to be, what was your, um, you know, because although you went to school for art and you went to graduate school for art, I imagine that you, there weren't a lot of like straightforward classes in making murals and, and doing it at the scale that you're doing it and in the way you're doing it. So what was your first experience doing a mural either with a mentor or on your own? And, and how did you get into doing it on your own? Yeah, the very first one I did was actually in high school. Um, I had an awesome art teacher and she, she put up a huge um, canvas roll up and there were three of us who did a, it wasn't really a mural because it wasn't directly on the wall, but it was large scale. Um, and then the next ones I did were uh, a, also through youth programming that I was doing through Providence After School Alliance. Um, so though I did two that were led by me. Um, and then in college, I was really lucky. Munir Mohammed, some of you may know him, awesome painter and muralist um, based in Providence. He did a course on mural design and I was actually the teaching assistant of that class. So uh, I helped with the research and I helped wrangle all the students and also participated in the painting. Oh, that's great. Um, on a sort of practical level, have you used a projector before? And like, is the, what's the, um, if you have, like what's the difficulty difference or what are the qualities that versus the grid system? Yeah, I think the grid system does take time because you need to measure, um, you'll see artists now, they're doing a different version of the grid where they use a bunch of squiggles as points of reference. So that eliminates the time spent to like measure out a grid. Um, I haven't done that yet, and I've never used a projector just because I don't have one. There, it's a barrier for me. Um, I also always wonder how they do it, how they get it set up at the right place to project on the wall they need, and yeah. how they protect it while they're installing. So I've always avoided it. Yeah, I was gonna say it seems like a projector would be way harder than doing grid. <laughs> it seems like it'd be a lot more trouble that way. Um, are there any ideas for a project that like if you had any budget and could do a project anywhere, like what would your dream project be that is like a fantasy to you? I would really love to grow the youth development uh, program or that idea. Um, Philadelphia Mural Arts, they do really awesome programming with murals. Um, and they have subdivisions within that program. And I would love to kind of develop my my youth programming to evolve into something like that one day. That's definitely the dream. Um, in addition to the to the spaces you were talking about in Salem, are there other places like that? Or is, or is there some kind of database where people can find those, these sort of locations like that where artists can go and 
and can do these sort of temporary works in addition, they bring in people. Like I wasn't familiar with that location before you mentioned it. Yeah, that one I only heard about because I was living in Salem at the time when it was first launched. And so I was able to participate in some of the early ones. It, it is very local. A lot of these are local and they want that their applicants to have residency in the area of the installation. Um, so that can be limiting, but I would say the best place to look would be to local agencies. Local ones we have here are the Avenue Concept, um, Providence Art Culture Tourism sometimes does some public installations and even different cities. Uh, I, I know East Prov Providence had a call for artists recently. Excellent. Um, does anyone else have questions? I have plenty of questions if no one else has any, that's fine with me. Um, how one of my other questions was going to be um if you you know when you're translating something from like a smaller scale to a larger scale um and i feel like your palette and you sort of mentioned this when you were describing your own background like your palette is so specific and so recognizable in some ways um for you are there challenges to that in terms of looking at something in a small scale using one in like color on small scale, sometimes when you translate it to a large scale, does the color not translate in the way you expected or is that a challenge for you? Uh, I think the color definitely translates. Um, where you might see a change in color is from your reference image to your mock-up. Um, but I, that's actually a great point. It's really important to do a mock-up so that you can see the color relationships um, and choose those colors in advance. So you're not stuck at the wall trying to figure out colors. Um, and because there is consistency in how those colors will relate to each other once they're large, it's good to figure that out in advance. Another reason it's really important is because paint is really expensive. You wanna make sure you have the right paints and you have as close as you can to the right number of cans of paint. Um, before you start yeah it seems like in order to do what you're doing you have to be are, do you feel like you're an incredibly organized person and like an incredibly structured person because it seems like you would have to be like you can't just willy-nilly go in and be like painting on the wall so is that part of um why uh this appeals to you or is that do you feel like that's part of why it seems like and, and also your presentation was very organized and very structured so it seems like you're a very organized person is that correct yeah, I think that's safe to say. Um, and there is definitely, uh, I've been wondering recently if I'm too structured. I, I know this doesn't work for everyone, but for me, I think it's really, uh, you have to be organized to execute a project on time and on budget and to be reliable. Um, I, I definitely have anxiety about uncertainty. And so that's why I plan Sarah here as a project manager. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I feel a kindred spirit there. I was, I, as you were doing your presentation, I was like, oh, I can see why, why she's doing murals and why she's so organized. It's coming through. Um, a question from Anne is, uh, are the murals ever lit so they can be viewed at night? That's something that I have started to think about. Um, I haven't really had a chance to make a proposal where that can be part of the budget, um, but I, I love the idea of that. I mean, it's just another way to activate a space during a different time of day. I think that's a great aspect to think about. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, let me see what were some of my other questions. Um, another question that I had in terms of sort of technical is how long is your average sort of research phase for a project you're working on? When you were talking about the octopus project that you worked on, like it seemed like just the research element of that in terms of coming up with a concept and tying it into the space must have taken a long time. So what's that like for you? Yeah, I think it really depends on the project and so many of these uh, a lot of the content will kind of simmer below the surface, sometimes for years before it becomes an idea. Um, with the octopus, I just happened to be a student 
at that dojo and I've been going for years on and off. So I, I happen to just have the knowledge available to me. I'm not sure I would have arrived at that design if I didn't have that existing practice. Um, and with the, with the mural class that Munir ran, we did an installation at the Rhode Island College Adams Library in one of the lower levels. The theme for that was evolution of writing. And um, I, I took that very literally and I kind of gravitated to a section of books about uh, like written alphabets. And I found a book that spoke directly about the evolution of writing and had samples from all these different time periods and throughout space, space and time um, on earth though, um, with different writing systems. So we use that as the basis for the design. We took samples from all these different writing systems and kind of made them radiate out from the center of the wall. Um, so I, I would say it can take anywhere from it just depends on how much time you have. You can do research in an hour and come up with something. You can spend years with a, a subject and really stew on it before coming with an idea too. And is that project still there at Rick? I think it is. Yeah, I, um, I know my dad went there recently and he saw it in person, um, but that was a few years ago, so I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, are there any of your projects that have now been uh, painted over that like you particularly miss? Um, no, and some of them I hope are gone. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is one that went missing. Um, the first one I did for Salem Mural Slam that also had really excellent response. Um, nobody knows what happened to those murals. <laughs> But how did it go missing? Uh, the organizer is probably the only person who can answer that. Whoa, huh. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Um, let's see, what are some of my other questions that I had? Um, I wonder if I asked them all already. Um, another uh, location that came to mind, and I don't know if if you're familiar with it, is there's that place in Miami, Wynwood, which is like pretty well known, I feel like. Is, do you know if that's a place where, um, where they have changing murals or, or are there other places where, do you have like places in mind that you'd be interested in applying to, you know, add a mural somewhere that's not local or, or what do you think about that? Yeah, I definitely love the idea of traveling to do mural work. I was really excited uh, last time I went to Art Basel. I happened, a, a muralist that I befriended in Lynn happened to be there and he hooked me up and I was able to paint in Florida. Um, so I love the idea of painting in different states. Um, Wynwood is really interesting. If you ever, um, if you ever go to Art Basel or Art Week in Miami, usually at the beginning end of that week, like right before Art Basel actually starts, all of these muralists from around the planet will descend upon Wynwood, which is uh, an area outside of, or a specific area in Miami, I think. And you'll just see like famous painter over here, famous painter over here, just everyone installing. And it is somewhat, it is, I know that it is organized. There's people who arrange the lifts and the big name artists to get them the real big walls. Um, but there's also, I think some amount of spontaneity and opportunity. Um, you might be able to show up with a, with a design, walk up to a shop owner and say, can I paint this? And they might say, yeah. Um, but you just have to be able to also drop the change on however much paint it will take. So what is the, I mean, I know that it's, I'm sure it's a range, but like, what is sort of the base price for just the paint on like, a, let's say like a, I don't know, like a five by five or 10 by 10 mural or something like that. Like, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, if you can give us a point of reference on how much that costs, because I have no idea. Yeah, I would say supplies 
minimum would be a hundred um, for, especially for something that's small. And it really depends on the number of colors that are involved. Um, you might have something that's ju that just takes like very minimal two color latex paint. You might have something where someone's doing something in a realism style using spray paints that might cost you like, I don't know, four or 500 for something that small. Wow, that's great to know. Uh, and then an anonymous question we had in the chat was, have you ever had to go back and use different materials um, on a mural after seeing the result, um, like adding texture or correcting texture or something like that? Yeah, the one, uh, when I was moving out of an apartment once, I was trying to be slick. I was like, I'm just going to mix my own paints and cover up all these holes. And the acrylic paint just was so obvious. I got charged because <laughs> it dried oh, no. darker than the paint. It was glossy. Um, but that's really the only time I think other than that, you can, it's pretty safe to use a mix of paints and they're pretty forgiving. That's great. Great. Um, does anyone else have any last questions in the chat before I turn it back to Funa? Um, one other question is, any chance uh, you have mural, uh, have you ever muraled in uh, egg tempera? Have you ever tried that? I haven't, no. Um, it, it sounds interesting, but I think I really like working in spray paint um, just because spray paint just interests me. I think even culturally growing up in hip hop culture, spray paint has an appeal um, and latex paint is just more affordable egg temper. I would definitely be really interested in seeing someone do it, but I haven't. That's great. Um, so then without any other questions, I'm going to go back to Fauna so that she can, uh, she has some wrap up comments as well. Yeah. Oh, that didn't work, did it? Okay, hold on one second. Thank you. So I do have a few projects coming up. This September, I'll be at Witch City Kitty, a cat convention in Salem. I'll be unveiling a new uh, piece that I am doing for the event, which is not a mural, but it's three feet by three feet. Um, you could check them out at witchcitykitty.com. I, I have an exciting mural project that I'll be a part of in downtown Providence before the end of the year. And next January, I have an exhibition at Risca in the Atrium Gallery. Um, so keep your eye out. You'll be seeing more from me. And I am back in the New England area and I'm available for murals, portraits, collaborations, and live art events. And I just wanna thank you again, Michael and Providence Art Club for hosting me. And thank you all so much for your attention and your time and bringing your thoughts and questions. And I really look forward to seeing you at future shows at the club. Thank you so much. It was a really, really great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'll have the video of this up on YouTube probably sometime tomorrow and I'll circulate it to everyone who is in the registration list. Um, so thanks again, everybody. Thank you for Una. Have a good night. It was awesome. Have really well night. done.